Would you lead us in a prayer here in a heartbeat? <coughs> Is there anyone who didn't get a book yet? Uh, I think there's one or two back there. All right. Two books. Look at that. Two people, two books. In fact, I think there's still a book in the back uh, if there's anybody else that needs one. 
I'm really happy to see all of you here tonight. Uh, we've got some visitors with us, and that's just fantastic. Uh, to start us off talking about a new series that we're going to be going for the next quarter. Quarter is about 13 weeks, so we're going to have about 13 weeks to talk about something I love to talk about. I think it's really interesting. Um, it's also the thing I like talking about because it's one of those things that makes us different than everybody else. Um, and it's the idea of the structure of the church. And uh, for a lot of people, there, there's just a lack of appreciation, especially you know, if you, you didn't grow up in a church where the conversation was about how is the church designed and, and how is it built and how does it work. These are the things we're going to be talking about for the next 13 weeks. I promise you, we're going to see some things. We're going to look at some things maybe you haven't thought about before. When you think about the design of the church and the way the church is meant to work. And so there's going to be a lot of things for us to cover and talk about. And so I'm really excited. And tonight we're going to start ourselves off with a conversation about why it is that we need to study this. Why this is something important. Before we get started, Barry, I've asked if you'd lead us in a word of prayer. That was <coughs> Our most dear Heavenly Father, we approach your throne this evening giving thanks for this day that we're able to come here as Christians of like purpose faith, come here as the ecclesia, to be able to gather together, to be able to look into your scriptures of how you would have the church function and how you would have us conduct ourselves as we function in that church. Help us to understand, Lord, that it, how, how valuable, how valuable it is uh, that, we, that we learn about what you would have us to do here and and that how we can praise your name and glorify your name through love and good works that is found here in the church and help us understand that principle we ask in jesus name amen amen thank you very much barry Somebody asks you, uh, you know, how is your church structured or, you know, how does your church work? Um, where would you go in the Bible to kind of talk about that? What are some of the books of the Bible that might help you to talk about that? What, what would you say? Hey, let's turn over to, and where would you turn? Second Timothy. Oh, or First Timothy. Or first yeah. Timothy. <laughs> um, Timothy. Anthony, you should get a star for that because that's, Sometimes I thought somebody would say Acts, and Acts is a great book for studying the history of the church. But the best book to talk about how the church is designed is, in fact, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy was a book written, and it says right here, Paul telling us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, why did he write it? He says, well, he was coming to see Timothy, but he says, if I'm delayed, I write so that you know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar, and the ground of truth. First Timothy, Paul says, is written so that you know how the church operates. It's a really fabulous study. Uh, you know, we did a study on it. Uh, oh, Teresa, when was that? Last year that we did First Timothy, and we talked about how First Timothy works. And one of the things you find in First Timothy is that First Timothy is almost like if somebody said, hey, I'd like to start a local congregation. How do I do that? First Timothy tells you how, and it almost gives you kind of an order of how to do that. Number one, he says, you got to get some teachers. You got to make sure those teachers are teaching the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, the word of God. By the way, he'll tell us. That's kind of neat. He'll tell us that the doctrine of Christ is the gospel, is the law of Christ, right in that first chapter. He gives us all these little tidbits, but he says, the first thing you got to do, Timothy, you got to get some teachers set up. Number two, he'll start talking about what the church does. It'll be things like praying and who's responsible for things like that. And number two, chapter three, he'll talk about elders and deacons. We're going to be spending a lot of time talking about elders and deacons. And, and he'll tell them, how, well, here's what elders and deacons, getting them in place is going to look like. Number four, he gives this important warning. One of the things the church always needs to be watching out for is apostasy. Hey, pretend I don't know what that word means. What is apostasy? Teresa? Falling away. What kind of things make them fall away? What was he warning about? False teachers. false teachers. Yeah. The danger of false teachers. You got to watch out for that. One of the important things the church is supposed to do. Number five, the work of benevolence. I love big words that we don't use every day. Benevolence is a word like that. Benevolence is just another word for saying taking care 
of people with needs. And specifically, he talks about how the church is supposed to take care of the widows in the church. It's an important thing the church is responsible for. Finally, he goes on to talk at the end about the work of admonition. Somebody's not doing what's right, the church is responsible to get them corrected. And so with this book, he gives us this fantastic, fantastic lesson on these things. Now, there's a second book that a little shorter, but it really is about the same thing. What's that book? Titus. Titus. Look at you, Anthony. You are fantastic. Titus. Titus says, uh, it's an abbreviated version of the same thing. You know, what's really neat about the way the New Testament works is sometimes Paul writes a big letter like Ephesians, then Paul writes a, writes a shorter letter like Colossians. They say the same thing, but, the, but one's an abbreviated version of the other, and it just gives you a really neat understanding of things. Titus. Titus, Paul says, was written, he says, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking. A little different way of saying it, but it's about setting in order things that aren't set in order. So the book of Titus, what does he talk about? Well, he talks about elders again in chapter 1. Chapter 2, he talks about teachers. Now, kind of interesting, he doesn't necessarily call them teachers. He says they are the what of the congregation. Anybody remember this? I'd be impressed if you do. Uh, chapter what did you say, Barry, you remember? No. The older men and the older women. Oh, now that's an interesting description of those that are supposed to be teachers among us. Might put some of us on the spot. Older men and older women who are teaching the younger men and younger women. So he's talking about teachers. He talks about Titus and his work as a teacher. A lot of chapter 2 is actually about Titus. Chapter 3, he gives this warning again about, you know, make sure you're teaching the right things. A lot of the similar ideas then that we find there. Church structure, church structure. So what do we mean when we say church structure? Well, you know, probably the thing that we're thinking the most about when we step into a study like this, and we think of these certain works that come up. Uh, what, are the, what are the works from Titus and Timothy that come to our mind first when we take, think about a, and I say work, well, I'm gonna use a lot of words that I hope that we can understand together the word work, another word office. Be careful how I use those words. I want us to understand these are, these are things that people are doing within the church. What are the four works or offices of the local church? Gregor? Teacher, evangelist, deacons, and elders. Teachers, evangelists, deacons, and elders. That's the four works. From 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, they, he, he really pronounces on these things of what a church is about. Teachers, preachers, elders, deacons. These are the things that churches are supposed to be thinking about setting themselves up. Now, um, we're going to talk about this in the future again, but let me ask you. Uh, I typically will point out from 1st Timothy chapter 1 that of these things, we see in the New Testament churches without preachers. Uh, for example, the church in Corinth. Uh, it looks like Apollos was their preacher. He had left. They had no preacher. They probably had no elders, no deacons. But what is it any church has to have in order to, ha to have a church working? Teachers. Yeah, teachers. The church doesn't have teachers. Well, I ironically, if they don't have teachers, they'll never have anything else. Because teachers lay the foundation. So it's interesting that teachers, and we'll see this when we talk about teachers, teachers are something that the Bible puts the most emphasis on the church needing. But the church structure also includes the works that a church does. Or sometimes I like to use the word the purposes of a church to kind of stretch the idea a little further so that we understand that, that getting ourselves organized the right way is part of the purpose of the church. But you have benevolence, you have, what are some of the other works? I didn't put them down, but you know, because Paul doesn't talk about it much in Timothy, but what are some of those other works we're supposed to be about? You guys are mailing out stuff right now. Some of you are doing a great Great work on that. Why are you doing that? Evangelism. evangelism. Yeah, reaching the lost. Now, the other side of evangelism, in fact, it's really the same thing, except it's not for the lost. When it's for the saved, what's the word that describes it then? Edification. Another word we don't use very often. Um, but edification means building up. You know, the sermon that to the lost helps them to know who Christ is, to the saved builds them up. It can be the same sermon. We understand that the church can do that work. One act can accomplish evangelism and edification. It's the target or it's the recipient 
that defines that. Can you think of any other works? Benevolence, worship. Oh, well, I gave you it away by saying worship. That was the one I wanted to get. Church comes together for worship. There are certain things it has to do. No, there's also things it's supposed to chase and pursue. The right doctrine. Now, that's kind of easy because what's the right doctrine? The Bible. But what's the problem that people have with pursuing the Bible all the time? Paul told the Corinthians, you got a problem with this. I'm writing this letter. You might remember he says this in 1 Corinthians 4. I'm writing this letter so that you learn not to. That's it, Monique. So that you learn not to go beyond or think beyond what is written. In the Revelation, he says, don't add to, don't take away from. So sometimes doctrine is is the idea of, of staying within it, not adding to it, not taking away from it, but investing ourselves in the entirety of it. You might kind of say that those are the big ideas. You can't take things out. You can't put things, add things extra. The charge is all the doctrine and finally discipline. Church discipline is a conversation. And this is what the word sound pops up. Now, by the way, the word sound is really interesting. You think of a building with a foundation that's really good. It's sound. And when you talk about church structure, but church is pursuing these things, Paul says to Timothy and to Titus, this is what makes a church sound, stable, successful. One of the things we'll look at here in just a second is to say that when you look at churches like the seven churches of Asia and some of the churches that weren't stable, maybe structure is part of the problem in that instance. Got a couple of questions for you to start us off this evening. Uh, number one, I'd like you to give me some examples. Um, I really prefer New Testament examples if you can think of them, but I'd also like to hear some examples if you, something comes to mind. What are some examples of churches that failed because they did not have proper structure? Churches that failed, were failing, were in trouble. What can you think of? Uh, they don't follow, the, they don't follow the, the, the pattern that we're Okay, they don't follow the pattern. Tasha, I'm going to reword what you said. I liked it. Tasha says it, a pattern that repeats. They don't follow something like 1 Timothy as though it is a pattern. Lots of times churches say, well, we'll just add what we want. What are some of the offices that churches add in today that aren't in the Bible? What are some of the works people do, Debbie? Youth minister. Youth minister. Oh, that's a good one. That sounds like something that should be in the Bible. Is it in the Bible? No, it's not. Interesting enough. Go ahead, Debbie. I kind of cut you off. And also, uh, music director. Music director. Yeah. Or yeah. Band or yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. What else? What else you got? Worship leader. A worship leader. Now that's kind of tricky because. I think it's fair to say, you know, Al's one of our worship leaders. You think of a song leader. But I'm not female either. That's right. That's right. How about people that shouldn't be in certain offices? That's not actually, Al, that's a better example. I wasn't even thinking that way. But people that maybe aren't supposed to be leading in certain aspects or fulfilling certain offices, doing certain offices. You know, uh, my, I have some family that are musicians. And they, they get hired out as musicians. And they say the most common job musicians get in their area is to be hired for churches. Now, of course, we have a problem right away. We said, well, you shouldn't have instrumental music. But the second half of that is th they don't care what somebody's religion is to participate, too. So there's just a lot of things about that uh, that's really strange. It, it's not something we think of because we think that's crazy just to even have instrumental music. But sometimes they'll hire people to come in. They're not even believers to participate. Participate. That's pretty awesome. Uh, what else can you think of? Any other offices? What do you got, Al? Teenage elders. Teenage elders. Uh, they go door to door, show up. Um, Elder yeah, Elder John. Yeah, uh, Elder Bob. Those guys, um, by the way, they're not even elders in a local church so much as they're elders in a larger group. But yeah, there's something on there. George? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, specific offices. Like I said, I want to say some of these things we're describing, it's not that they're sinful. Marriage counselors are a good thing, or uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, music directors aren't a bad thing at all. You know, somebody goes at the high school and they're a music director, but are they part of the pattern? Well, we're not supposed to think beyond what's written. Also, you can talk about state 
daycare centers. Yeah, that that was add that to the works. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they have to, they have some they hire people. To yeah. Run. You know, one of the interesting things, just studying with somebody recently about things when the church adds on a organization to itself, they always have to add on leadership in that organization. You know what's really interesting? Let's say a church says, hey, we're going to add a, a daycare center to our building. Who's going to be in charge of that daycare center? Are we going to hire an elder or a deacon? You don't know usually hire? Somebody outside. Yeah, an outsider who's an administrator. Or and It's kind of interesting that, that you start having to go a different way. That, that, that creates you think, well, that, that might be a problem. Gregor, what else? Revelation shows us two churches, Pergamum and Theatra, that don't compromise the election. Excellent. I'm glad you brought us a church, uh, a church in the Bible. What did they, what did they do? Well, in uh, Pergamum, they were uh, accepting the teachings of Balaam. I'm yeah. Sure were. And in uh, Theatra, they had a uh, priestess who was corrupting their... Called her, what was her nickname there? He says, she's a... Jezebel. Yeah, I, I thought maybe you would get Jezebel, right? So they had a teacher that was not teaching sound doctrine. And they're in trouble. What was, Gregor, what was going to happen to the church at Thyatira? They were going to be, have their candlestick removed. Yeah. God was going to provoke, uh, I'll just say it a different way. They're going to have their candlestick removed is what he says. Maybe I say it something like, they're going to revoke their charter. Yeah. They're going to take away their franchise. They don't get to be Jesus' church. If they don't get that straight. Serious stuff. Serious stuff. Uh, how about the church in Corinth? They have a lot of problems. I'm, I'm really thinking that maybe a, a Sunday morning's, uh, uh, you know, following Luke, Acts is a great study to follow into. But I kind of thought, you know, I really find 1 Corinthians interesting too because there's a church that's in trouble. And there's a church in trouble because they didn't have leaders in the church. And it's interesting how they were really struggling. They didn't have a preacher. They didn't. And Paul says, that sometimes I wonder if there's not even wise men among you, teachers problems that they had. So there's a church there. Uh, the churches that Paul sent Titus to in Crete, what did he say? You remember what he said about those churches? He said, you need to set in order the things that are lacking. Right. <coughs> lacking. Well, that, that sounds pretty serious. You know, if we're building a building and you come as, and, and you know, uh, uh, Greg's not here, so I'll pick on Al uh, as, a, as my construction guy tonight. Al says, you know, this building where you're laying the foundation, you're lacking footing. I barely know what footing is. I know it's important, though. <laughs> you're lacking footing. What does that mean about our soundness of the building? So he says if things are lacking, that's a problem. That's a problem. So that's why he sent him out. Teresa? Unfortunately, I've been in situations where there were unqualified elders that didn't even know what their roles were. Yeah, that's that's a very uh, a, a very a profound thing because you know honestly when you become an elder you know I don't know about you but the secret elder book that they mail you <laughs> I, I never got mine so you have to know the word of God to know what you're going to do so sure that's a pretty serious thing uh, a church like that a church where uh, here's one I see a lot my experience is when the preacher's not qualified and a lot of times churches bring in preachers that aren't qualified. And, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about that I think might surprise you is a lot of us don't even realize the Bible gives qualifications for preachers. But it does. And I've seen a lot of preachers that were not qualified to be preachers. And a lot of damage comes out of that. You've probably seen the same thing, too. So we all have seen experiences. We can all point to events in the scriptures. I'm glad you brought up Revelation 2 and 3 because of the seven churches. Five are in trouble. And we can kind of point to some of the not following that pattern as being some of their problems. So those ideas, those things we've got can be problems. Debbie? And even if we don't have qualified men to be elders, we have men who can lead the church. Uh -huh. And those men, um, oh, I'm, I've seen just disasters where um, people come in from outside um, maybe from another state or whatever, and they they say they're members of the church, mm -hmm. but when they start teaching, the men of the congregation really have to like put their foot down. All right, so Debbie, no. we're going to come back to this in a second, because what are those people called? Point number three, point number four. <laughs> wolves. We're going to come back to wolves, because that's important. 
I'm going to throw an idea out to you, and I want you to think about this, because one of the things we think about is we think right now we're a church without elders. What else? Deacons. Which one is more important? Don't answer that. It's a trick question. <laughs> because you would be wrong if you pick one. They're both part of the pattern. And so lacking is lacking. And sometimes we think, well, you know, we're, we're trying our best, but the churches in Crete might have been trying their best. They're still what? Lacking. They're still not firm because they still haven't got it. Let me say this. We might some, One of the things I'm tempted to say is, well, you know, we're trying our best. But if we're not always working, let me, let me qualify this to say, I don't mean always working even if we have elders. If we are not always working, stepping back for a second, on this work right here, we are not sound. Okay, let me say it again. If we are not always working to train up teachers, preachers, elders, and deacons, if that is not something that we are always working towards, we are not sound. Any more than if we aren't doing the works of benevolence or worship, or if we are not pursuing sound doctrine and discipline. If these things are not all our priority. We don't get to pick, right? If they're not all something we're working on, then we are not sound according to what Paul has told Titus and Timothy. It's an important point to understand. And of course, you notice the way I'm wording it, working. It means maybe we're not there. But that could be true of a lot of things that we're working on. But the point is, if we are not working, and sometimes where, where churches go bad is they say, ah, we got elders, whoo, we're done. You've got elders until, until one elder gets sick, if you have two or something happens and it's very easy not to have elders, not to have preachers, not to have teachers. It's something that we are always working on. Let me grab a couple of points and we'll go to our second question. Go ahead, Debbie. So it's <coughs> also important to know that just because an elder becomes an elder doesn't mean he's an elder for life automatically because in Acts 20, I think we're going to get to that at some point, um, they were warned about, you know, that even they could fall away. Yeah, that's right. Because he says wolves will come from where? Within. From among yourselves. Yeah. But we have to be watching the elders. I guess, yeah, that's true. That's true. Sense. That's true. An interesting point that we're going to talk about later, too. Uh, do Debbie, I'll put you on the spot. Do you remember what church those elders were from in Acts 20? Very good. Now, do you remember what church Timothy was preaching at in 1 Timothy? Ephesus. So what's interesting, and by the way, the book of 1 Timothy is after, because it's one of Paul's prison epistles, after, uh, actually it's not a prison epistle, but it's, it is written after he goes Acts chapter 20, that the point is, there's still a process that needed to be pursued, either because there were elders, or there were not anymore. Both of those are important things for us to get. Barry, go. Yeah, is it, keep, we haven't got there yet. We're going to get to Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. That's right, yeah. It's very important that you understand when we're talking about uh, elders and deacons, the teachers and how we're equipped and why we have to be equipped because of verse 16. Uh, and some... some Churches are not equipped, and they find themselves in verse 16. And that's a real serious, and we'll get oh, there. Yeah, it's nice. just that you, yeah. uh, this is something to keep in mind. Just keep going. So Barry's talking about the idea that we haven't got there yet, but Ephesians 4, one of our critical passages. In fact, I kind of put it as our heading passage for our whole study. That if these things are all working together, it produces a church that is able to build itself up. Now, Barry's point kind of draws us back to say, if we're not working with all of these things working together, then we're not going to be successful as a congregation. That's a important point. Second question, uh, from time to time, I hear churches talk about, and, and by the way, I want to hit one of these kind of hard because I hear it a lot. Uh, maybe they don't have teachers, preachers, elders, or deacons. 
What, what kind of things might a church say as an excuse? How about teachers? Uh, I know the one I'm thinking. Go ahead. Um, there are congregations that don't have Bible classes. Okay. And they, well, that's true. Actually, I didn't think about that, Debbie. And they feel like that it's a responsibility to learn at home. Yeah. And, and it, uh, with Debbie, you kind of opened something for me. I don't want to go down. Um, but Debbie's right. There are churches that actually their belief is not to have classes. Um, is that is that healthy? Well, I would suggest, and Debbie gave me a, it's the same look she gives me sometimes when I say something weird to her, uh, which is a no, no, no uh, kind of statement. Teresa? They just don't want to or they don't think they should do How many times does somebody say, you know, I've done a lot of teaching in my time. I kind of feel like I'm done. How many times does somebody say that? By the way, I'm being delicate here, but it's usually not younger people that say that. Older people will say, done a lot of teaching, you know. My mother is in her 80s, and she teaches the Bible class. She says, Brian, I can't believe that there's women in their 50s that are telling me, you know, I've taught plenty of classes. I think I deserve a break. What is Paul telling Titus in Titus chapter? Paul telling Titus in Titus chapter 2. Who's responsible? Older women, older men. So a lot of times people say, I've done enough teaching. Woo! I'm done with that part of my life. It's just, I, I, it's just my, not my thing. Mm. What else? What other things we hear on teachers? I hear this one a lot too. Somebody, uh, Debbie? <clears throat> Sometimes um, as we get older, we're not physically able to teach a class. Good point. So then we become <clears throat> teachers in a different way. Very good we point. We teach the younger women or the younger people to teach. Very good point. So, Very good point. I like that idea of being able to teach to teach. I like that a lot. Uh, Teresa, were you just moving your arm funny? All right. Here's what I hear a lot. The Bible says not all of us, not many of us should be teachers. You know, at James chapter 3, James says that. But you know, it's kind of funny. Hebrews chapter 5 says you all ought to be teachers. If James 3 is actually saying not many of us should be teachers, the Bible's got a contradiction. Unless... The actual context of James 5 is if you don't control your mouth, which or James 3, which is what James 3 is about, you're not teaching anybody. Well, that's what he's saying. But I'll hear people say, well, no, no, the Bible says not many of us should be teachers. Woo, gets me off the table. No, it doesn't. Go. So when we think about um, the Great Commission, when Jesus told his disciples to go yeah. and do what? Teach the gospel to who? Yeah. All. All. That means what? That means you as a Christian need to know what you're saying. Yeah. You need to be, you know, so you have to actually put this put the work in to study and yeah. know so when you go and talk to your neighbor or go talk to you know, a co-worker or, or anybody about the gospel, you know what you you know what the basic at least the basics. You know, yeah. so we don't want to be like babies, you know, that need you know, um, um, milk. Yeah. Instead, of, instead of hard food. Yeah. Know, because why? Because they don't know how to teach or how to how to talk to the individual about the gospel. Nice. So nice. To me, it's like anybody that says that I'm I'm not a teacher. Well, no, yeah, you are. Yeah. You know, the question is how much effort people put into it. You know, and the funny thing is, Anthony, when you kind of boil down some of the softer language about teachers, the Bible says when we're singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, we are teaching one another. Yeah. Um, and I often say that if I can't tell people what I did to be saved, I might not be saved. Um, so we've got to be careful about that. Uh, one more comment on teachers, Barry, and then we'll move to preachers. Well, it's not my talent. Oh, no, nice. It's not yeah. a reasonable service because of oh, your yeah. talent. Yeah. In chapter 12 of, uh, of Romans. But also it says there that the idea of being transformed. So this idea of being transformed versus conforming, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times we conform to things. We 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 add something onto the plate, yeah, and we call that growth, and we call that. But there's a difference between transformed by the word and being conformed by the word. Mm -hmm. Transform is it's in your actual character. It's I what like you that. do. That's a really neat so, idea. Yeah. So I think a lot of people. They have this list of talents in which they think they can do. Yeah. And 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 teaching's not one of them. So yeah. Yeah. Um, this is the one of the four 
that the scriptures are going to reveal to us, the expectation is we're all going to be in here somewhere sometime. Now, I want to be clear, because right now maybe a few of you are shaking in your boots. It doesn't mean you're going to be right up here or in front of a group of people. It means you have the ability to pass on, kind of Anthony said it, to pass on the information about what it is that you did that makes you a Christian. Ramon? Oh, no, no, you just made the mistake of getting your hand up. That's a bad thing. Teresa? You're leaving the class, but there's a lot of teachers in the That's room. right. That's right. Very good point. Uh, very good point. Um, and again, teaching is a broad thing, especially when you think of older women teaching younger women, and it says it's things like, you know, how to, how to take care in your home and things like that. Very non-necessarily sitting down and going through the Bible conversations. Maybe it's a, you know, here's what I did whenever I was in that position kind of story. Number two, preachers. A few years ago, uh, I was with a congregation, and they hadn't had a preacher in several years. But let me be honest, that happens. Lots of congregations really struggle. But the difference was this congregation wasn't doing anything about it. They weren't trying to find a preacher. They weren't. They said, we think we kind of get by on our own. I'm going to steal this excuse and say, number one, a lot of times people say, well, you know, we got guys that can deliver lessons, and that's more or less the same thing. But, but what we're going to find is that if the Bible says this is a qualified work, that might not be accurate. It might be the case that we're actually not pursuing the pattern. If we say, yeah, we're okay without a preacher, and uh, that, uh, you know what, we don't need to worry about it. <clears throat> like I said, I, I'm sympathetic to, that there are a lot of churches looking for preachers, and I certainly don't mean to impede that, but I do mean to suggest that sometimes people say, well, I think we're fine without one. Anybody else have something? Why don't we sometimes have preachers? Maybe the preacher says something kind of mean, or don't want another one. Anybody else? Teresa? Well, some congregations just say they can't afford that's a good point. That's a good point. And, um, and sometimes that's tough, but, you know, a lot of the churches I've worked with couldn't afford, couldn't afford me. <laughs> there are ways around. The scriptures give us ways to handle that um, that, are, that are important to understand. Elders. I'm going to take away the easy one. You say, well, there aren't men qualified. By the way, that should be what you think about these first two, too, as well. We'll take that one out. We'll just say, no, nah, that's not what I mean. I mean churches that aren't trying. Why don't they try? They're comfortable. Because, Anthony, what if a church doesn't have elders, and they're working on getting elders, and they get elders, what's that big word that starts with a C-H and we hate it? Change. We hate change. We, we as in the human race, we, as in uh, brethren all over the world, I, I dare say, we, as in our congregation, we hate change. And you get comfortable the way things are. You don't want to change. <clears throat> ah, I think that's a big one because elders imply accountability. Elders imply accountability. And a lot of people don't like that accountability. Years ago, I was in a congregation and they didn't have an elder, or uh, didn't have an elder, they didn't have elders. And uh, one of the men said, you know, sometimes I think we're better off without. I thought, what, what makes you say that? He says, well, you know, uh, because then we all get to have a say-so. And, and, oh, yeah, I've heard of that. That's called catastrophe. I'm familiar with it. <laughs> Sometimes people who might not get, aren't called to serve in leadership, get propelled into leadership. And that can be a dangerous thing, too. Last one. This is the hard one, because I can't really think of a good, I couldn't think of an example. Anybody here help me out? You got an example? Why might a church say we're not looking for deacons? By the way, I have seen it. Churches that weren't looking for deacons. And I suspect sometimes that just happens because they just think, well, we got elders. Aren't we done? It was a lot of work to get elders. Aren't we finished? Uh, oh, cool. I was saying that because you have, some congregations have the members and they have elders. They expect that the elders do all the work. Yeah, sometimes we've got elders and they'll do all the work of, of being a deacon. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Barry, then Debbie. <laughs> I think the idea of deacon is as a servant that we find in Acts 6, they're a servant to the congregation. They, yep. they, and a lot of times we put them in the benevolent or in the, uh, nailing a nail on the wall. So sure, speak, sure. That type of thing, and that's fine. Uh, but they're also support just like anyone else yeah. as far as God's word is concerned. And sometimes we feel 
that everybody, every man, he's a good man. Every man can nail a nail. Yeah. Every man can do this. But I think we're talking about direction and uh, uh, qualified people that would be able to not only, because they have qualifications too, and not a, not be able to take care of the physical things, but also to, to be able to be a brother that would be able to look up people. Nice. Nice. I like that. We're going to talk a lot about what deacons are and the misunderstood ideas. A lot of times we delegate them because we think, well, they're not spiritual. Oh, that's a big mistake we make. Very, that's real good. Debbie, last comment. Well, they said, please, that's what I was going to say. Is we People just don't understand what a deacon is supposed to be. <clears throat> right, nice. I want to hit four things I want us to, to think about tonight. Why, why is it we need to have this class? Why is it we have to work on structure? Number one is obvious, because this is what God said. Years ago, when I was talking to that church that said, well, we're not working for a, a preacher, I said, well, why not? Don't you know that what God said? That that's what God wants you to do? And I said, well, I guess I hadn't thought of it. But we don't think of it sometimes. We think, well, we're meeting together. We're successfully accomplishing worship, one of our purposes. And we kind of feel like, well, you know, uh, no, nobody burned down the building this week, so we're ahead. <clears throat> it wasn't a fist fight, so we're doing okay. It's a commandment of God to pursue all of these things. It's not open for debate. It's not a, uh, I, try, I was t telling Greg earlier, I was trying to get a picture of a, a McDonald's hamburger or something where you can say, hey, hold the tomatoes, hold the pickles, uh, hold the deacons, hold the teachers. That's not how it works. We order, uh, what we, we don't get to order and pull things off. We're supposed to pursue all of it. Number one, why, why do we need to pursue structure? Because this is what God told us to do. God said, get elders, get deacons, get teachers, get preachers. Always be working on that. It's not up for debate. This is the command of God. The command of God. Number two, second reason. Debbie mentioned this already in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30. Because wolves will, notice I underlined it, wolves will come. Debbie, you gave the story. Tell it one more time. You said, how does it happen? How does it happen? Well, um, somebody comes in, well, in the example I was in. And I want to hear it. They came from out of state. Um, they were teaching 80, 70, basically. And um, they were just causing so much strife in the congregation. And, you know, people... They had very flowing words, and they could persuade people. And it's just um, Debbie. It's just scary. weren't they wearing the wolves attire, the wolves red suit that you're supposed to wear? How do you know a wolf? Because of the strife they're causing, because of the false teaching. If we know what the Bible teaches, then we can notice them a lot sooner. So the promise of the scriptures. Is that, and by the way, this is what was interesting about Paul talking to the church in Ephesus. He says, wolves are coming. Not, yeah, you always got to watch out for wolves. They might show up. They're going to come. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. False, he doesn't call them wolves there. He calls them false teachers. His false teachers will come. Promise. Second Timothy 4 verses 1 through 5. He says, Timothy, you're, you've got to always be working on this because... People are not going to want to listen. First John chapter 2, 18 and 19, he calls them their antichrists. He said, this is the promise of God. This is the promise of God. Debbie, I'm going to ask you a follow-up. Where's that congregation today? Um, non-existent. It is non-existent. Wolves will come. And God has designed the church structure kind of like a fortress. And the walls are these works. But what is a city without walls? Defenseless. Defenseless. Wolves will come. Barry? In Matthew, the 7th chapter, verse 15 and 16, helps us understand that commission and omission, it's just not what you say, but how you act, the fruits. And it says here, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. 
you will know them by their fruits. And and the nice. idea there is is that they will come. You don't you don't have, you don't have to. It's not like, well, we got everything together. They will come. They will bring up uh, by their by their behavior or by their actions. They will bring up false teaching or lead others with them in that false teaching. Yeah. So nice. Matthew kind of brings that out to us. That's a that's a great passage, by the way, because of the statement, "You'll know them by their fruits." You know. It's kind of a, a pretty good statement. I'm going to rush us through because we only got five minutes left and I got two more to go through. Number three, uh, I'm going to skip this question. Number three, because, kind of leads into what Barry said though, because people will be lost without church structure, without teachers and preachers and elders and deacons, without us constantly working on those things, souls will be lost. Absolutely going to be lost. Uh, you know, Debbie mentioned a congregation that's no longer in existence. And by the way, I, you, you know, lots of stories like that. Of congregations that a wolf came and it broke apart. Or they didn't pursue structure and they just fell apart. Souls will be lost. Um, you know, let's do it. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but let's go ahead and read Ephesians 4 because it's, it is the central passage to our, to our study. Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is saying, uh, discussion, the idea of the importance of the structure that is given by Christ. Jesus gives gifts. Verse 11, he says, Jesus gave apostles, prophets, evangelists. What's evangelist another word for? Preacher. Woo, glad you guys knew that because I wasn't sure, huh? Evangelists. Pastors, what's pastor? Another word for? Elder. What's, which is another word for? Bishop. Shepherd, bishop, one more. Overseer. Overseer. Boy, you guys are good. And teachers, why? For the equipping of saints for the work of ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of God. Why? Verse 14, because if we don't, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of whom? Now, you think the word wolves could have fit in there nice? Yeah. By the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Boy, that's a big one. Cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. That's a great way of describing scheming there. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things to him who is the head Christ from whom the whole body, joined in it together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body, and the edifying of itself in love. It's a we'll be lost or we'll make it kind of choice. Uh, we're going to skip this next question. For, again, for the sake of time, now let's go to our fourth point. Because churches without structure die. I already heard a good example of that. But I want to take this a little bit of a different way. Uh, Gregor mentioned a couple of churches in Revelation that had some problems. They had a teacher that shouldn't be teaching. They had some doctrine that shouldn't have been doctrine. And they should have taken care of that. And they weren't taking care of that. And what, Gregor, do you remember what was going to happen? And we mentioned a minute ago, we'll say it again. What was God, Jesus, going to come and do? I'm, ooh, I do remember. I'm going to revoke your charter. I'm going to take away your franchise. Specifically, says I'm removing your candlestick. You know what that means? It still will say church on their building, but they probably didn't have something that said church on their building. But you're not really Jesus' church anymore. You know what that means? All of your confidence just went out the window. Churches without structure die. Revelation two and three. God will make it happen. Now that's one that ought to shock us. That if we're not doing the thing God has said, God will bring about our demise. That scares me, but it's true. If we're not purposing ourselves the way we're supposed to be, we lose it. We already saw Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, and the blessings we're going to get if we do what's right, but if we're not doing it, none of that's going to happen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, Paul there talking about the work that he does, the work that Apollos does. Paul was an apostle. Apollos, I told you already, he was a preacher. He said, we're doing different works. He says, God brings about the growth. 
but the requirement is we're all doing our jobs. If it's not happening, the church dies. Churches can be dead, right? What does Paul, uh, I'm sorry, what does John, Jesus, actually, in Revelation, tell us about the church in Smyrna? Or Laodicea. Okay, help me out. Which church is it that had the reputation for being alive? Laodicea. Laodicea. Woo. George, give yourself two Brian points <laughs> for stumping the teacher. Laodicea. You have a reputation for being alive, but what are they really? Dead. Churches can be dead. Oh, I tell you what, we're really at our time. So I'm going to grab a couple of our last comments and then we'll wrap up. So uh, go ahead, Teresa. So if God removes the candlesticks and the light moves on out, not just to ourselves, but to those around us, what will have Excellent point. Excellent point. It, it's also affecting, affecting everyone around us. Tonight, I hope you got a little scared, a little uncomfortable. Because... Addressing our need for church structure isn't just something that you say, well, there's a couple of people here that need to really think about it because they're maybe the ones that we're thinking of. No, <clears throat> every single member here needs to put on that construction hat and say, structure, I'm part of the team. This is my work too. This is all of our work. I'm so glad you guys are here tonight. Um, I'm so glad you're here because I want you to be thinking about, well, what is expected of me in this process? What am I supposed to be doing we all have a job to do in regards to the structure of the church. Thanks so much for great comments tonight, great ideas. We're at our time. Hit it, Roy. Odyssey, yes. it's not Odyssey. Oh, it's not. He it was Sardis. 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 <laughs> George, your points are revoked. <laughs> oh. How much were those worth it? Yeah. <laughs> I would have cashed my hand. Yeah. Well, well, you got to have you know about you, 10000 to get a good stock. You better yeah. cash oh. it. Lay up. Uh, so, well said, Anthony. We're. You know, by the way, there was another mistake. Yeah, there was another mistake a couple of weeks ago where somebody said that Luke chapter 22 was the biggest chapter in Luke. Yeah. Well, let's not call it a mistake. Let's call it different facts. There were different facts in play that it wasn't the case. Verses are numbered. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Good evening, everyone. If you would like to grab your regular songbooks first and mark those, song number 287. <clears throat> Song number 287 will be the song after the invitation tonight. And then if you'd like to grab your supplemental song books and turn to song number 11. Song number 11. <clears throat> I will wake the dawn with praises. Um, we'll sing all three verses of the song. If you feel up to it, let's stand. <clears throat> Dawn and sunset, fierce and joyful, each reflect his mighty ways. With the sea and sky before me, I will give him all my praise.
His glory, brother, sisters, love His name and do His will. Like the sands upon the shoreline are the praises to Him still. follow along the invitation tonight will be from Colossians chapter 1 verses 19 through 23. Again this is Colossians chapter 1 verses 19 through 23. It says, For it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled, in the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. As we consider the invitation tonight, I really wanted to key in on verse 23 there. It says, if you continue in the faith. And then a little later on, it says, are not moved away from the hope of the gospel. <coughs> the warning there is that we as Christians can fall away. And I really wanted to key in on the idea of, of the faith and the hope of the gospel. We have so much we've been given through the, through the gospel. I mean, the forgiveness of our sins, uh, the church, the opportunity of a changed life through the gospel, uh, the hope of eternal life, a brand new body in heaven, such wonderful things we have, but we can lose all that if we don't stay faithful. And the warning given here is that we have to make sure that we stay grounded and continue in the faith. So the, the first part of the invitation is really for the one who's a Christian. Are you staying faithful? Are you staying grounded? And uh, it's important for us to consider. And we do this on Wednesday nights so that we have that, that exhortation to, to stay faithful. And the, the church is here to encourage people if you're struggling, but we really encourage you to, to examine yourself. Are you staying faithful? Now, the, the second part of the invitation, jumping back to verse 20, it says, Having made peace through the blood of his cross, you were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Through the gospel, we have the forgiveness of our sins. But if you haven't obeyed the gospel, you don't have forgiveness of your sins. So the, the second part of the invitation is really for the one who's not yet a Christian. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, you're lost. And the encouragement is to obey the gospel, to, to achieve the, the peace through the blood of the cross, to, to be reconciled to God. And I really encourage you to consider the opportunity. And to become a Christian, you need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your past sins, uh, and, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Confess Jesus as Lord and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And that's something that you could do even today. So at this time, we're going to sing an invitation song. If you'd like the prayers, or the help of the congregation, or if you'd like to be baptized, we ask you to come forward as we stand and sing. There's a fountain free to 